please welcome to the stage Tiffany Cross of MSNBC and Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. You all look beautiful out in the audience. Um, it is my honor and thrill to share this stage with our wonderful guests. Um, first, I will just let you know, as you just heard, I'm Tiffany Cross. I host the show, The Cross Connection, that airs on MSNBC every Saturday uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please tune in there. Uh, to do your part to help preserve democracy, which is what we'll be talking about today. And it is just a thrill and honor to introduce our wonderful person who you all came to hear. And this is Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, as of course you all know. And obviously she needs no introduction, but uh, I do want to honor her and tell you a bit about um, Madam Ambassador. Um, so Madam Ambassador is a career diplomat, as you all know. She returned to public service um, after retiring from a 30 five-year career with the U.S. Foreign Service. She returned in 2017, so as you can imagine, she started her career in elementary school. Um, she has served as the first female U.S. ambassador to Liberia, um, and of course in other diplomatic posts around the world, and was later appointed by President Joe Biden uh, to be the representative um, of the United States um, to the U.N., and was sworn in by another history maker, Vice President Kamala Harris, on February 24th in 2021. Um, and Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, it's a pleasure to share the stage with you. Well, thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here and delighted to uh, see this huge audience out here. Absolutely. I want to get right into it because we don't have a lot of time, as you guys can imagine. Uh, the ambassador is clearly very busy uh, during this, uh, this uh, gathering of the UNGA. Um, so we'll start out just kind of on a broad perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you can talk us through um, what the overview of the Undersecretary General's priorities are for this particular UN, and in what areas the United States is taking a lead role? Good, that's an excellent question. Uh, this is a, a historic uh, UNGA this year. Uh, it's the first time we've come together fully uh, in two years because of, uh, of COVID. And it's the first year where uh, so many leaders get an opportunity to engage on some very key issues. For us, the key issues are dealing with food insecurity, food insecurity that has been exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. We were dealing with the issue uh, because of the impact of climate change, because of the impact of the COVID pandemic. Add on top of that, uh, Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine, and this situation has become more dire. So we will be focusing a tremendous amount of attention on food insecurity. Secretary Blinken will be hosting a, a, a summit on that uh, later this week. Secondly, we have uh, been very engaged on global health, and the president will be hosting the replenishment of the global fund the United States announced uh, $2 billion. Uh, he will be announcing that we will commit to $6 billion of the $18 billion that the Global Fund uh, has uh, requested. And we, uh, our, our commitment is $1 for every $2 that others uh, contribute. And third and, and equally important are the issues related to the UN Charter and UN Reform. I gave a speech in San Diego, uh, sorry, in San Francisco yeah. uh, about two weeks ago where I talked about the importance of UN uh, reform and that's particularly important now with uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine. They are a member of the Security Council uh, and as a member of the Security Council, they're not living up to what one would expect a permanent member uh, to do and how we would expect one uh, to behave. Yeah, absolutely. I want, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about food insecurity, which you mentioned, um, because that casts such a dark shadow across the globe, as you know, as you said, exacerbated by the war in Ukraine. Um, how can the global community mobilize to address some of the food insecurity we're seeing? You know, first and foremost, we need to recognize that this is a global issue. It's an issue that impacts us locally uh, as I noted in a recent trip that I took to Chicago, where I engaged with communities on food issues in Chicago. I traveled to Uganda 
and to Ghana and sell those issues every day that are being faced by women in the marketplace, by businesses that are dependent on grain that uh, would have been brought to them by Ukraine. What can we do about this issue? Uh, we can engage with the global world. We can look at how we address these issues in the short term, but also in the long term. In the short term, we're providing significant humanitarian assistance and development assistance to countries around the world. We're working in communities here in America to see how we can address uh, these issues at the community level. In the long term, we need to look at how we build capacity uh, for countries to feed themselves. And then, most importantly, Russia needs to end its unprovoked war on Ukraine. Uh, their war has uh, led to this, as I noted, becoming worse. Uh, they have blocked and, and, and attacked uh, Ukrainian uh, farms. And uh, we're hopeful with the deal that the Secretary General uh, negotiated uh, with the Russians and the Ukrainians that grain will continue to flow out of, um, out, out of Ukraine over the course of the next few uh, weeks and months, but more work still needs to be done in that area. Speaking of um, just the work that needs to be done in different areas, it feels like we're at a very unique position globally because we're seeing the rise of populism uh, across the globe. We're seeing different regimes take over in different countries. And so even with the food insecurity mm -hmm. issue, I'm curious to hear from you, um, given this moment in time, this snapshot in time mm -hmm. in history, what does the UN look like? Well, how does the UN operate? What is the future, if we're looking forward at the United uh, Nations, what does it, the General Assembly, what does it look like five years from now, 10 years from now? Uh, that, is, uh, that is the question of, of the hour. Uh, what will the UN look like? And our uh, discussion about UN reform is about how we make the UN more fit for purpose in the next five, the next 10, uh, the next uh, 20 years for uh, future generations. So the UN needs to do some sort of soul searching as, as an institution and as an, an organization. The Security Council, as we noted, uh, needs to be reformed. We need to focus more uh, attention on human rights. This is not about the rights of of nations, but the rights of, of, of human beings, and that it will be an organization that focuses on not domination of people, but support of people around the world. So how that will look it will be part of our, our discussions over the course of, of the next year, and how that comes out depends on those discussions. But we all agree that the UN does need reform, uh, it, it, it needs a nudge uh, forward to address the challenges of our times that are different, many of them, from the challenges that were faced 77 years ago when the UN was created. Yeah. And I, I want to talk a little bit about world leaders because we did hear China's president, President Xi, express concerns about Russia's unprovoked war with Ukraine. This is after they were holding hands on the world stage. Um, if you could, because we were backstage eavesdropping to the last session. So uh, I'm sure the audience would appreciate hearing from you. How exactly has the United States held Putin accountable for his actions? Uh, just look at what we have accomplished in the UN since this war started on the 24th of February. We brought 141 nations forward to condemn Russia's actions. We suspended Russia from the Human Rights Council. We are isolating them in every single vote that uh, we hold in the UN. And while they have the veto power, they can't veto the voices of condemnation that they're hearing every single day in, in the council. And we will continue those efforts to isolate them in the future. I was very uh, uh, surprised, but also delighted to hear that President Xi and, and Prime Minister Modi criticize uh, Putin uh, directly about what they're doing in, in Ukraine. So they're, they're losing their, their, the, the supporters that, that they have. And what Putin, I think he, his calculations were completely off base, he did not uh, I, th I think he, he certainly did not 
uh, realize and calculate that NATO would become stronger. Yeah. Uh, he did not uh, calculate, he certainly miscalculated the unity of Europe, and he certainly miscalculated uh, the resolve of the Ukrainian people to fight for their independence and our support for that. But our voice is enough because as someone who's covered the war from you know Washington D.C. from our nation's capital, uh, it doesn't seem like any of these restrictions have have hindered him. Uh, what has hindered him has been his own miscalculation of his military power. Their nuclear power certainly that's something to be concerned about, but their military power has come across a bit amateur. So what is the plan to bring his efforts to a screeching halt? Well, certainly it's to continue our, our support for the Ukrainians. The only reason we know that his military is weak is because Ukraine was so strong. Yeah. And Ukraine was able to respond in the way they were able to respond because they had the support of the international community. They had the support of the United States. We provided Ukraine over $15 billion since this war started. Uh, it has been bipartisan support, and that support we're committed to continue. I want to bring it home a little bit. Um, so while the United States is on the world stage um, addressing issues of democracy across the globe, we have our own challenges here in the United States. And so I'm curious your thoughts as to what the United States global position is now, given that we're under new leadership in this country with President Biden, but there still is this undercurrent and this ugly underbelly um, that it exists here in the United States, but like I said, also across the globe, uh, when it comes to populism, white supremacy, racism, et cetera. Um, curious your thoughts as we navigate this issue, uh, not just on a global scale, but on a domestic one as well. Uh, again, an excellent question. It's one that I have been asked many times since I took over uh, this role. And let me just say that our country is not perfect. We know that, and our strength is that we acknowledge it. And our strength is that we're constantly reassessing and we're constantly looking at how we rebuild our democracy and make our democracy stronger. We continue to be a role model and an example for the rest of the world. Our leadership is so important to people around the world. When we came back into the Human Rights Council, smaller countries welcomed that. They welcomed our, our presence. They said they couldn't stand up to the pressure without having the United States standing with them. And so that leadership is truly important for the rest of the world, despite the fact that uh, people are seeing some frays around uh, the edges. But this is not the first time our country has experienced this. We've come out of it before, and we will come out of it again. And I think every country around the world, they're all watching how we deal with the situation. They're watching the fact, because many of these countries can't acknowledge their shortcomings. They can't acknowledge uh, their weaknesses. I can sit in the Security Council and talk about racism and talk about my own experiences of racism growing up in, in the South and not be worried that when I step off the stage, I'm gonna be arrested uh, by the police. That happens in a lot of countries around the world and they appreciate the fact that we still have voices that can stand up for freedom, that can stand up for democracy and can stand up for human rights. Yeah. Well, as a fellow daughter of the South, I can certainly appreciate that and respect that. Um, I know, uh, because we were chatting backstage, I know that you've been very busy from sunup to sundown, meeting with a lot of people. And I'm just curious to hear what some of the feedback that you've gotten on this global stage uh, about the United States and about the, the, this current UN gen General Assembly. Uh, there's a, a lot of enthusiasm, uh, first about the fact that we are back. The president last year said, we're back, our leadership is back. We rejoined the Human Rights Council. We uh, rejoined the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. We're engaging with the world. Uh, we're engaging with our allies. And we have expressed that in so many ways over the course of the past year and a half. So what people are looking at now is where we go in, in the future. And that's what the president will be uh, addressing as he talks to the General Assembly on, on Wednesday, what our leadership has brought to the world. And again, I, what has buoyed me over the course of the past year and a half <coughs> is the welcome 
that uh, we have received from the rest of the world and, and the support that we have gotten from our allies our, and our friends, as well as those people who uh, may not be so friendly. Uh, they want to engage us as well uh, because they know that we are an important player and when we weren't there on the international stage, they did feel the, the lack of our presence. I want to ask the uh, final question because we're running out of time. Uh, I say this, we had a, a 20 minutes for this conversation, which is a lot longer than a cable news segment here in America. So thankful for that. Um, but I do want to bring up something because this is something we talked about on my show many times. And in different polling in our country, uh, a significant amount of people believe the United States will cease to being a democracy in the coming years. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious your thoughts about that on this global stage, how you would respond to people who have that legitimate fear as we see perhaps the end of Trump, but not necessarily the end of Trumpism. We are a democracy. We are rooted in democracy. Our country's strength <clears throat> is our democracy. And I don't see, and I have not heard in my discussions with people around the world, a fear that our democracy will disappear. Uh, they, they see some, as I said, the phrase around uh, the edges, but when we look at January 6, for example, when we were all watching in horror what was happening, our Senate still came back and did their jobs. Our institutions uh, stood, our institutions moved forward, and we did have a, a transition. And, and again, there have been threats to our democracy before. We had a civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had uh, uh, race. Uh, Crow, civil rights era. Yeah. All of that. And we've gone through um, world wars. Mm -hmm. uh, and we still survived as, as a democracy because in the end, people know that democracies deliver on their needs. And I think they saw... Uh, uh, some of the issues that resulted that brought so much uh, tension in our country over the past four years. And certainly it's more comforting now to be able to breathe a sigh of relief and start to rebuild uh, the, you know, the country that we all uh, know and love and, and appreciate. I'll tell you, uh, before I came, I was at uh, my hotel um, at the bar having club soda. <laughs> and uh, I was chatting with the bartender who um, was not born in this country, he was born in India. And I told him, he said, what, what are you doing today? And I told him, and he very impassioned said to me, you know, I came to this country 23 years ago, and I will tell you the idea of America is so important across the globe. Mm -hmm. And that now that he's a citizen, he's dedicated to fighting for at least the idea mm -hmm. of America. So as we bring this conversation to a close, I welcome you to share your thoughts with the audience um, on why the idea of American democracy is so important and how you're helping to uphold it. You know, because democracy is about people. Uh, it's about delivering to, to people and people around the world see that they believe in it. It is why so many people want to come to the United States. We're a country of immigrants, where people have come from all parts of the world for many, many reasons, many of them fleeing conflict, fleeing persecution, and they know that they will get a welcome uh, arm here in the United States. And even when sometimes that seems like it's a little weak, we always rally and we're rallying around the people who are being sent to New York and Martha's Vineyard and other places uh, around the United States because that's what our country is about. We care and people know that. Well, thank you so much for taking time to share with this audience today and thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Good. Thank, thank you, you all. Have a good session.